Welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, your host. Glad you could join me. Thank you. Hopefully you're headed out to train, play with your dog, enjoy the outdoors in some other way until hunting season gets here and it's getting closer by the day. I'm counting down some early seasons, first of September, as you well know. Hey, we got a great show in store for you. A new hunting guide in Arizona shares some of his tips. Not that he's new, just officially a guide now. Rashawn Gordon joins me. He's an old hand at desert birds and dog training, and we'll get all the good stuff. Puppy advice, hunting strategies, critical dog training, do's and don'ts, and how to find those wily quail in the dry, dusty desert. It's all made possible by Roughland, Performance Kennels, Happy Jack Dog Care Products here on South Dakota, the Ringneck Nation, and Dr. Tim's Natural Performance Dog Food. Well, <clears throat> thank you all for your um, advice, if, if I can. Yeah, yeah, I guess I can call it that. A couple weeks ago, we had another dog trainer on, had a lot of great advice for all of us when it comes to... Um, introducing new hunters to our fraternity. And uh, so I thought I'd uh, take a look at the Facebook page and see if you had any other advice in that regard. And yes, you do. One question by um, Levi and Ashley Smith about a short hair that won't fetch anything besides dead birds. So, um, you know, instead of giving up all the birds you saved in the freezer for dinner, any advice? Well, uh, Mike Ziki says, uh, wrap bird wings on a dummy. That works pretty well for a young dog. And then uh, Ben Warner says, force fetch will solve that problem. Anything will be coming your way. All you got to do is point to it. Yeah, that works too. Great. Yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad to hear that it's working for uh, some people out there. Um, answering your question, Ron Funk. Just listen to the Valley Quail segment. Where's the Owyhee River? Well, that's kind of the border between southwest Idaho and southeast Oregon. And then it dips into Nevada over there as well. Uh, Bruce Shilo says, uh, regarding newbies and advice, respect the land and enjoy every minute in the field. You never know when it's your last. I hope you haven't learned that the hard way uh, in some personal way, Bruce, by the way. Nick Hayes says, have no expectations. Enjoy your time afield with man or beast. If you have a dog, point their nose into the wind and follow. Boy, isn't that the truth? That is actually um, close to that quote by Ray Wiley Hubbard, the great country songwriter I, I know and love. He says, the days I keep my gratitude higher than my expectations, well, I have really good days. And so do I. Thank you, Ray Wiley. Thank you, everybody at the Facebook page. Keep it coming. We've always got something to talk about there. The Upland Nation podcast is brought to you in part by Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products. New gun cases. Yeah, finally, finally, a gun case from the guys who know how to make their stuff. You know, if you, if you have any products or if you've seen their products, you know what kind of quality they've got. This is a 12 ounce wax canvas, padded wool interior, bomb proof crazy horse leather, removable and adjustable crazy horse leather strap. You can carry it over your shoulder, one way or the other, all sorts of things there. Learn more about them at sageandbreaker.com. And also by the Ringneck Nation here on South Dakota. Hunt HuronSD.com is where you learn more about them and all the prizes they're giving away right now. All you got to do is sign up, get a free information packet. Got all sorts of goodies in there from discount coupons to public access maps and three prize packages, hotel, restaurant prize packages. Register now at HuntHuronSD.com. Okay, I promise an exciting and informative show. My guest today, Rashawn Gordon, 
of Gordon's Gun Dogs and Guide Service. He's out of Welton, Arizona. You all know him from Facebook. That's how we got to know each other just a little bit, and I am looking forward to having a first, I was going to say face-to-face, but ear-to-ear <laughs> conversation. Rashawn <laughs> Gordon, welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. Thank you, Scott. Glad to be here. You know, I've I've watched you from afar, and I know I'm not a stalker, but uh, but I, I've just I've watched you uh, grow and change in positive ways over the years. Congratulations! You're now training gun dogs and guiding hunters. How how did that all come about? Give me your backstory on that. Well, I've I've actually raised and trained German short hairs since about 1989. And I ended up taking a break from it for about 20 years and just got back into it and walked away from a job that I had been loyal to for years and just decided that's what I wanted to do. And then recently I decided I wanted to add guiding to what we do here. And so we did it. Was there something that pushed you over the edge? Uh, You know, a lot of us say, I can't work for anybody else anymore, or I just cannot not train dogs or run hunts. What what, what was it for you? Well, what made me quit my job was uh, we let go one of the other guys that worked at the treatment plant that I worked at, and I ended up working seven days a week, and I worked through hunting season, and I loved to hunt, so... That was it. I told my boss I need to find somebody because I was going to quit. I bet he, they, he was very unhappy. <laughs> they really thought I was kidding because I'd been an employee there for 17 years. I was in great standing. And they threw all sorts of offers at me to get me to stay. But you can't replace time. I learned that a long time ago. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Tell me one more thing about that, because every day I'm I'm learning this over and over again. But uh, for you, did you just kind of you know uh, you know put a pro and con list together, or what was it about valuable time and how little we have? Well, I had a couple things that actually made me think about that. One was uh, I had a bunch of bird dogs, and there's no point in having hunting dogs if you're not hunting them. And the other was I was talking to a friend of mine and. He kind of brought it to my attention, you know, about our age. We're the same age. He's like, you know, we only have about 25 more quail seasons left in us. And when he said that, I was like, what do you mean? And then he goes, well, you plan on living forever? And I had never really thought about it until that day. And then it was just like, wow, it really hit me hard. So I want to make the best out of the, the quail seasons that I have. Yeah, I'm hoping I'll get five more good seasons out of life. <laughs> Everything after that will be a bonus, especially considering my knees the last few weeks. But um, good on you. I'm glad you've come to that decision. It's it's one that everybody, you know, at some point comes to, some of us later than sooner. And um, so here you are. Um, if you had to, uh, if you had to, uh, where would you be hunting right about now? I would, well, if it was my choice and I could do it, believe it or not, my favorite game bird in the world is mountain quail. Huh. You got a long way to go to find those, don't you? Yeah, I would go back to where I was raised in Southern California. We had a lot. I I shot a lot of mountain quail there. If I recall, you're you're still a desert rat. I mean, you were even back then. Didn't you grow up, I don't know, Palmdale, Lancaster, somewhere like that? I grew up in Lancaster, California. And I hunted all over the state of California, which, you know, California gets a bad rep for being, uh, you know, full of liberals and and gun haters. But it's actually a great upland bird hunting state, and people don't realize that. And That's a good thing. I'll keep it to myself, you know. You know, I'm guilty of sharing it myself, and I'll be down there again at least once or twice this season. But where are the mountain quail in that country? I mean, I I can guess, but because I grew up in in the San Fernando Valley. Uh, but I, really, I, you were, you you weren't too far away from them. No, uh, but I wasn't a hunter back then. So, um, so are you talking about the those mountains between us and you guys? There's uh, the Angeles National Forest. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of mountain foam there. I used to do my my best mountain crow spot was right above Little Rock Dam, 
And there was a place there called Little Sycamore and Bear Creek. And the hunting there was just absolutely incredible. And you would see large coveys of mountain quail. And somewhere I have a picture of me sitting on the tailgate as a uh, probably in high school with 33 mountain quail on the tailgate. Wow. Um, you're not going to believe this, but I think I've been to Little Sycamore. We were probably it, it was a pretty popular area. Well, we were pretty active Boy Scouts back in the day, and we spent a lot of time up there. So it just rings a bell. Well, I'll tell you, yeah, you know, you're right. Uh, everybody else out there, you're sworn to secrecy. Don't tell anybody about the great game bird hunting in California. We'll all keep it to ourselves. <laughs> you, me, Rashawn Gordon, who's going to talk more about desert quail as well, because I'm intrigued. I don't get to do enough of that, so we'll get on to that as well. But tell me a little bit about your your dog training philosophy. Let's start with the dog breeds that you like. Okay. I uh, originally I started out with English setters, and they were great dogs. Then I moved to Britneys, and they were good dogs. But back when I was younger, and in a lot better shape, I was really addicted to chucker hunting. And I only had one Brittany at the time, and he just didn't have the endurance for the type of hunting I was doing. And I was fortunate to live close to a trainer named Bodo Winterhelt. I don't know if that name rings a bell to you. More than he rings a, a bell. I shared an airplane with him once. Wow, that's that's awesome. Because he, he was a great man. Yes. And I went to talk to him because he was a gun dog guru. He recommended that I try a, a German short hair. And at that time, I was super anti-German short hair. <laughs> and, but I figured I came to him seeking knowledge. He gave it to me. And I bought one, and then a few years later, I had 29, and I was hooked. Oh, yikes. <laughs> <laughs> That's when I can and... tr truly say I'm glad I didn't have your feed bill. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they're my favorite, they're my favorite dogs. Uh, being a trainer, I've got to train a lot of different pointing breeds, and I've got to see a lot of good dogs. I try not to tell anybody that, you know, the German short hairs are the best, they're the best, you got to have them. They're the best for me. And people should get the dogs that they want and that they desire and just make sure that they get them from a good hunting line and they'll be fine. They'll do exactly what you want them to do. Okay, here, a rabbit hole number one. We're going down to right now. You're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, the host. That's for Sean Gordon, Gordon's Gun Dogs and Guide Service out of Arizona. Uh, Bodo, Bodo's legacy lives on in three directions of the compass from me right here. Um, he, as many people know, he was one of the founders of NAVDA. He was also, he was also an incredible trainer and breeder of poodle pointers. And so I'm, I'm surprised Rashawn that you went to Bodo and he suggested don't get a poodle pointer, but uh, you know, if you were in the desert, then maybe it made a little sense, but out of all of that, what was the one thing that really con convinced you that Bodo is the guru that he is? Well, you know, um, the area I grew up in, at that particular point in time, hunting was huge. Mm -hmm. and, and we had a lot of bird dog trainers, a lot of gun dog kennels. And when I was talking to these people, they kept telling me, go see Bodo, go see Bodo, go see Bodo. So when I went, I, I, I got to his place. He lived in Quartz Hill at the time. That's right. And yeah. Yeah. He was down mm -hmm. there. Yeah. I was very impressed with him. He was nice enough. He spent hours with me talking. And so, again, you know, when you, when you seek advice from somebody that's highly recommended, well, when that advice is given to you, I believe you should take it. And I did. And it's changed my life. So I wish he was alive so I could thank him. Yeah, uh, we're all missing him, that's for sure. He had a long, full life, uh, lots of interesting developments along the lines of his background and all of that, but we do miss him as well up here. And in fact, uh, last, oh, I don't know, three weekends ago, I actually gunned at a training day over a poodle pointer named Bodo. 
I think that's amazing. Yeah, and he was certainly from the Winter Hell line. So anyway, uh, well, okay, we're back on the surface again, talking about Gordon's Gun Dogs and Guide Service. Rashawn Gordon, you know, um, if you had to get back to the, the the original question, which is, what's your philosophy toward dog training? How how would you sum that up? Well, one, you got to let the dog be a puppy. It's very important to let them go through their puppy stage and establish a good routine. And once you got that routine going, you also have to put trust in your dog. And when you're hunting, you know, with your dog, you're a team. And that's where that trust comes in. There's been a lot of times where I've made mistakes and I wanted to basically lead my dog away from where the dog was working only to have my dog actually find birds. So we got to remember that we're a team out there. And I'm relying on the dog for his nose, and the dog is kind of relying for my knowledge, and there's got to be a little give and take there. As I've said for years on the show, follow the hunter with the longest nose. There's the example of why to do that. Once they're on the ground, they can smell a lot better than we can. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny. In the last week, I've had conversations with somebody who owns a a four-month-old short hair and a 14-week-old wire hair. And they're both at opposite ends of the spectrum. The short hair guy says, just like you did, let that dog be a puppy. The other guy with the wire hair says, man, this dog is doing it. He's retrieving the hand. He's woed to, to the songbirds in the, in the uh, yard and he's swimming and all of this. And I'm thinking, well, y- y- could you be any more opposite? Rashawn, do you really mean that the dog gets no guidance, no direction as a puppy? I, I know that's a loaded question because I want to tell you, I want you to tell us what you really do with puppies. Well, I take them out in the field Mm -hmm. and I want to expose them to stuff, but I'm not putting any training pressure on them. You know, these dogs have a lot of natural ability, especially if they're bred right. Yeah. And what you want to do is you want to, you want to expand on that. Um, Maybe someday I'll, I'll kind of maybe send you some videos of how we, encourage that natural ability to come out of the pups Mm -hmm. and it's it's pretty amazing i i had a puppy that was three months old i took her out with us on a casual little walk out in the desert you know with an older pup and we ended up getting into a bunch of uh dubs during our late season dove hunt and i knocked the bird down and she went out and actually found the bird and brought it back to me and that was her first time ever coming in bird and it was just natural she went out found it picked it and brought it to me and you know you're right and i hear that i heard that with the 14 week old wire over and over again so you you are you are um i use the term guiding and that might be the best one for now you're not just letting this dog run rampant it's it's following some directions what are the what other things are you trying to do at that stage are you teaching any commands Oh, well, obviously, they have to have a recall. Yeah. Um, and I actually do basic woe training because mm-hmm. there's two commands in the field that have to be obeyed, and that's come and woe. Mm-hmm. And because, you know, both of those are important for bird work, but both of those can also save a dog's life. Yeah. Yeah. So those are, those are commands that there's no maybes about them. So I, I give them, you know, I start with, with those. And I'm not so hard on the woe because woe is also a complicated command to learn. But they can understand the basics that woe means don't move. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you want to build their confidence up in the field. You don't want a puppy that's constantly at your ankles. Encourage them to go out a little bit in front and, and, and to use their nose and, and to find things. And it's okay. People get upset. They're pointing butterflies or little songbirds or, you know, things like that. But that's a good thing. They'll turn off to game birds when the time is right. You do anything with the nose at that point, or you just trust yourself, trust the dog, trust the stuff that's out there that they might actually get sent on? Well, sometimes when I'm out in the desert, uh, if I see quail or 
uh, whatever, you know, I'll, I'll take them to where the, where the birds were just at and mm -hmm. let them work their nose. And, and it's really cool because a lot of times on quail, whereas they didn't have any tail movement, as soon as they get over that scent, their tail just automatically starts going. And I never get tired of seeing that, you know, because it's like, wow, instinct's kicking in on that little pup. It's pretty amazing. And then sometimes I've actually been lucky and had a puppy get, get there in the right place in time and actually get a point on birds. So it's all me. I love working puppies. What What is it about uh, dog training that really gets you excited? Watching them go through all the transitional periods. You know, the, the, the shy pup. And then all of a sudden you see them start to build the confidence. And then the day where you actually do bird introduction and then, you know, where the dog is running free and gets its first point off the check cord. And then that great day when you're actually in the field and everything lines up and you got that first wild bird point. And then I got all nervous because I don't want to miss that bird and usually end up missing the bird. But I just, I'll never get tired of that. That's just like super exciting to me. You know, you, uh, I come from a long line of teachers, and what you're telling me is you you like the teaching moments. You, you get really excited about when it's obvious something has clicked. Those are the milestones in a dog's career. And, uh, yeah, I think you're in the right business for that, Rashawn Gordon. I think that's exactly where you belong. Well, thank you, Scott. I'm, like I guess i got a few years doing it, and it's been an enjoyable ride so far. Uh, what is the biggest challenge you face as a pro and, and how do you overcome it when, when you're, when you're around, say, a an adolescent dog, maybe a dog that's uh, had a season under his collar, what's the biggest challenge there? The biggest challenge when you get an older dog is usually the handler, the owner screwed it up and allowed it to get into bad habits. <laughs> And then you've got to correct those habits, which usually you're going to get back. You know, you're going to end up usually seeing that dog back again because the guy's going to cause it to, to go back to where it was. And one of the biggest things that I tell people, only shoot birds that are pointed. Your dog busts a bird or take a few steps and breaks the point, and then you shoot the bird, you're rewarding the dog. And one step turns to two and two turns to 20. And the next thing you know, you got a flushing dog. It's supposed to be a pointer. I'll never forget my first wire here. I, I, at the end of that first season, I just resigned myself to having the first and only flushing wire hair. <laughs> I've, I've since learned a little bit more, but, uh, but if you see me on TV, you can't tell most of the time. Uh, what, how, how would you, how would Rashawn Gordon pro gun dog trainer and pro guide how, how would you define a finished dog in your world well i have wild bird hunting dogs and then there's actually a what i call a competition dog a hunting dog and a finished competition dog in my opinion are two different animals because again you know uh, in the competition world a finished dog is a dog that is rock steady, does not move. You go in, you flush the bird. It is steady. The wing shot hit the ground and does not move until you give the command to fetch or look for another bird. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the hunting world, again, like I said, you, sometimes you got to let a dog make its own decision. And a hunting dog needs to be observant. So if you hit the bird and the bird is, say, lightly hit wing, if that dog breaks to go make that retrieve, it's probably not a good idea for you to, you know, to uh, woe your dog because a wild chucker, a wild mountain quail, wild gamble quail, a 50-50 chance of recovering that wounded bird once it hits the ground. How so the dog needs to get on it ASAP. How about relocating? Does that fit into that same idea? relocation um usually like with my dogs i kind of know by the way they're pointing mm -hmm. the distance from the bird yeah we, we got one dog we call her tail her quail o meter <laughs> and when it's straight up you know you're right on top of the bird and when it's halfway you're usually about 20 yards away so 
if I want to, I can relocate or tell the quail meter, you know, is redlining. Yeah. And then we get ready, or sometimes we don't, I'll hold her back and we'll go up and flush the bird. And it, it's it's the handler's own discretion on what, how they want to relocate and when to relocate the dog. Well, go back to your chucker hunting days. Uh, I'm still deep into that. Um, that's why I'm worried about my knees right now. But um, you get a dog and you know he's on point because your GPS collar tells you so. Uh, but he's over the ridge and 180 yards away and it's uphill halfway. Uh, do you expect him to follow those birds as they waddle off over the next ridge or do you expect him to break off or do you expect him to wait for you? A good hunting dog, I would hope, would continue to follow them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, because, again... Uh, I've seen birds run off, to, you know, in front of a dog, and they're gone. Yeah. Never to be seen again. They may have gone to over the edge and jumped up and flew down into the valley. Uh, I'll tell you a quick story that's kind of similar to that. I was hunting in Arizona on what they call the Strip. I, I know. Going back, yeah, to my, yeah. going back to my truck, my dog disappeared over a ridge, and I, I didn't think nothing of it, and all of a sudden, I call for her. She comes back, looks at me, goes back over. I keep walking, and then she ends up being behind me and starts barking. <laughs> so I turn around, and I go up, and then she comes back over again, you know, and barks at me. And Third time, you know, she does. I'm almost to the top of the hill where she's going to come back over, and boom, there she was. We go back over, and she had a male gambles quail in a cactus. So she had been on point when she first walked over the hill and knew that I was going to continue towards the truck. And she did, you know, came back to get me several different times. And she did that on her own. And that's why, again, where I said it's important, you know, that you trust your dog and, and, and give your dog your, the respect that they, that they deserve because sometimes they have to make the decision in the field and you got to be able to go with it. That's almost... Timmy fell in the well story from a Lassie episode. Only the short hair was smarter than Lassie ever will be as a collie. That's a great <laughs> story. It's absolutely true. And it's so funny. I would, I would love to have been here for that one. Hey, you're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, the host. That's Rashawn Gordon. Gordon's Gun Dogs and Guide Service out of Welton, Arizona. Uh, Rashawn, I'm going to give you a moment to take a quick break while we pay a few bills. Happyjackinc.com is where you learn more about all the Happy Jack dog care treatments, remedies, and parasite repellents. Plus, their flea beacon. Sounds funny because it is. It's a fascinating technology. It uses light. It attracts fleas. While you are sleeping, it clears out a room overnight. This thing is incredible. And it's reusable. And it's non-toxic. You can get replaceable inserts. It works the moment you put it down and you turn on the light. If you've got a parasite problem, and uh, who doesn't, especially this time of year, take a look at the Happy Jack Flea Beacon at happyjackinc.com. And Flick is riding in a Roughland Performance Kennel these days. They're built like a performance cooler, you know, the one that starts with a Y. The things I like about the Roughland Kennels, multitude of things. Uh, an available second side or a back door. All those doors can be open from both sides. So if you're lefty or a righty or depending on where that crate is in your truck, and that also makes it really easy to take off and clean simply and easily. Multiple colors, a pile of accessories, including the water storage gizmo that I put on top of Flix Kennel. Learn more at RoughlandKennels.com. And Rough is Rough, spelled R-U-F-F, -F, RoughlandKennels.com. And that's a ringing endorsement, if I ever heard one. That is one of Rashawn Gordon's dogs, uh, probably the smartest one in the room at the moment. <laughs> Rashawn, welcome back to the Upland Nation podcast. Uh, do you have a Do you have a 
class clown dog in your kennel somewhere? Oh, that would be Jax, my Brittany. Ha, ha, ha. Oh, no kidding. I, I, don't, I just don't see them as cut-ups. Oh, if you met Jack, he's something else. I could tell you Jack stories that, well, they're X-rated, though. But <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this is a family show, so we'll exactly. skip that part. But, but, uh, um, but, of course, we're all thinking of it right now. <laughs> <laughs> but I've had him steal my box of shotgun shells when we're out shooting doves. Uh, just do crazy things like that. He's, but he's, he's, he's a joy to have in the field. And even though I own uh, mostly German short hairs now, I do have a couple Britneys. And Jack's being one of them. Jack's really kind of brought me back a little bit to having Britneys because of his humor. He's just been so much fun. So I'm glad to have him. You know, that's what I love about wire hairs. They look funny, and that makes you expect them to act funny sometimes. Um, but uh, go ahead and, and, and share with me what dazzles you about Jax. Oh, just as he's got the cutest little face and he's in his sparkle in his eyes. When I look into his eyes, it's almost looking at like a an inquisitive little boy. He just loves being out in the field with me. He's he's happy. Whereas my 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 short hairs, they're just programmed basically to hunt. Mm-hmm. They don't have, they don't really need that that human companion part, and I think that that's something that you know when I was young, all I cared about was putting that classic tailgate shot you know full of birds on the back you know and and that was great and and then when I got Jacks it was like wow this dog really likes me he likes hanging out with me and every time I go somewhere Jacks wants to be there he's just he's happy and I, I like that I like the having a little companion buddy. Who doesn't need a sidekick? I mean, really, exactly. that, is, that is great. Hey, I want to talk desert quail hunting in a moment. But first, when we're training our own dogs, and you've seen a million of them, you you know talked about the big mistakes many people make and that you end up having to fix. What is, what is one tip that you might offer us that we might not have thought of at any point in our dog's career for training? Be consistent and don't go a, – a big problem that people have is you start out with something and then you get on the internet and you go, oh, wow, well, this method looks better or well, could be faster. And then you stop and you jump on a new method and then you find another one and another one. And another. It causes massive confusion to the dog. Mm -hmm. Pick out a technique, stay with it, and finish the dog with that, and everything will work out a lot better. Easier said than done. We're all um, we all need to wear an e collar once in a while. I think when it comes to that. <laughs> I'm presuming you use one every once in a while. I I do use an e collar. Um, I don't um uh, for my dogs. I don't think that it would be needed for me, but it's also again a, a safety tool. Yeah. You know, it can also save your dog's life in the field. Do you do anything differently than most other trainers? I mean, instead of teaching woe that way, do you teach it this way? I have a method, like, if, I, if I'm working with my own pups and stuff, that most trainers would probably frown upon. Yeah. Uh -huh. But I'm going to tell you anyways, because I think it, it's something that people overlook. You know the old wing and the string trick that you, te you hear teaches promotes sight pointing? Yeah. Okay, well, I start off with that, and when the puppy points, I tell them, whoa. When the puppy moves, the bird wing disappears, and they actually start learning, whoa means don't move right by doing that. Okay, and then I also believe that the, it promotes sight pointing. Oh, yes, it is sight pointing, but a dog's, how do I want to word this? The dog's best sense that he has is a smell, so if a dog is three feet away from a wing. I truly believe he's also smelling that way. And when I had more access to alfalfa fields, I would take my puppies and walk them into the alfalfa field, and I would actually cast the wing out there and then work them downwind. And if you've been in an alfalfa field, you know it's pretty deep, you know, ankle yeah. high or so. Yeah. They're not seeing the wing. But when they would catch scent of it, 
they would miraculously point. I love it. And and I would I, I might agree that there's nothing wrong with a dog learning to sight point at some point in their career, pardon the pun, they're going to see a bird on bare ground and the choice is do I crash in on that bird and fly it or do I point it? You mean like desert quail hunting? <laughs> It's it's almost like we wrote a script here, everybody. <laughs> yeah, it, it you know Chuckers the same way. So here we are. Um, let's talk about desert quail, um, particularly gambles, because that's going to be one of the most common versions. What do you love so much about those birds? That, that I hate them. <laughs> Next to the chucker, they're one of the most frustrating birds there are to hunt. They live in miserable country. Not that it's steep and, and rocky like the chuckers, even though they have. I've hunted gambles in the same terrain that I've hunted chuckers, yeah. which really makes me hate them because nobody should have to climb mountains like that for a quail. Um, they're in cactus generally, which is one reason why I love it now because we have no cactus. Um, they're just a miserable little bird, but they're so fun to go after. How, yeah, yeah, tell me, what are your, uh, like, top rules, strategies when it comes to hunting gambles quail? Oh, man, I'll be giving away all my quail seekers. They won't need me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, first off, good pair of binoculars. I like to scout feeding areas first thing in the morning. And you can generally spot them on the hillsides or the, or the slopes. They like kind of open, uh, grassy areas. Then what you want to do is you want to get those birds airborne and scare the bejeebies out of them. Once you get them airborne and they lock their wings, you pull out your hawk call and you blow that hawk call like two times. Mark where they go. As you get close to where you think they're landed, blow that hawk call a couple more times, and that's where your dog comes in handy. A lot of times those birds will stick to the ground like glue. I've had as many as eight points within 30 steps. Wow. Okay, and you can really do very good with that hawk call and scaring the birds and putting them up in the air as fast as you can. Because a quail's number one uh, defense, basically, is to scatter and hide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're really afraid of predators from the sky, you know, eagles, owls, hawks. And once they know that there's one above them, they're going to hold tight. I finally, yeah, I, I dug my hawk call out. I'm putting it on my lanyard for chuckers this year, just as an experiment. Um, and it sounds like it's working for you with gambles. Um, how do the dogs treat these quail? And how, what do the quail do in, in response to a dog that's getting near them? Uh, generally, the, the cubbies will bust yeah. out in front of you because it's hard sneaking up on, on 30, you know, 30 quail because you got all those eyes and ears. And I always tell people that don't even try to sneak up on it. On it. You see them, just get them airborne. Try to get them busted up. Try to get them to hold. But the singles, once you get them busted up in, in the, the singles, I've had them hold unbelievably tight. I kicked the crap out of a bush one day, and, and, and I gave up. I'm, There's nothing in there. <laughs> Started to walk away, and I turned around and looked, and I could see two quail run out the other side. You know, they can hold very, very tight. So you just, you never know. What are you shooting when you're shooting for them? Um, here lately, I've gone to a 28 gauge. Yeah. And I shoot a uh, three quarter ounce of seven and a half. Plenty, plenty of shot, plenty of, uh, mass in, in that size does the job for you, doesn't it? Oh, I, I love it. I had, uh, I had a buddy that was kind of learning dog training underneath me and he moved to Minnesota. So as a going away present, I gave him my 28 gauge over and under. And then I just bought a Fab Arm 28 gauge over and under to replace it. And I love that gun. You're a man after my own heart. I wrote a story about giving guns away. I'm going to do it again in the next week or so. Good on you. And I wish that gun the best of luck. So, what is it about the 28 you love so much? I don't know. It just seems magical. Um, 
I had always heard that they patterned better, and I didn't believe it. Uh, as a kid, I grew up shooting the 20 gauge, and then I wanted a 12 gauge to be like all the men. And I bought one, and the first thing I, I realized that on average, I put eight to nine pellets per bird. Uh -huh. And my pellage average didn't increase by going to the 12 gauge, even though I'm shooting an ounce and an eighth load versus the standard seven eighths ounce load. My so, shoulder hurts think, just hearing about an ounce and an eighth. Yeah. <laughs> well, I got tired of carrying all that extra weight. So I actually went back. I, I got tired of, and I went back down to a 20 gauge and I shot a 20 gauge for years. Well, the 28 gauge that I ended up giving my friend, I had won that at a banquet. And when I, you know, took it out hunting, my pellet count actually increased. So I'm like, how does it increase with less shot? What's your so thought? I my, yeah. I mean, is it, I, I've got a guess on why that happened. Uh, but you probably if you probably think about it every time you pick up that gun. What's your, what's your theory? Well, I guess the shot string is a, is a little bit tighter. Uh-huh. You know, that's the only thing I can come up with. Some will argue it's the opposite. I don't know. I'm not a I'm not a ballistics kind of guy. I wonder if it's it's just like, you know, when I can't catch a trout, I put a gold ribbed hare's ear on and I catch lots of trout. It's because I'm confident in that fly. I bet you're more confident in that twenty eight than you are in anything else. You you think that might be part of it? It's, it's possible. It is possible. You I know, know I love it and, and when I point it birds fall. Yeah. It swings easier, doesn't it? Yes, it does. How much does yours weigh? Uh, just a little over five pounds. Yeah, yeah. I I put uh, I finally dug one out of the safe. I have one twenty eight gauge. I put it on the scale. It's five and a half pounds. My lightest twenty gauge is six and three quarter pounds. So I'm I'm going to try it. You ever try that on on chuckers? Would you shoot chucker with a twenty eight gauge? You know, I ran across them on the Arizona Strip about four years ago. And all I had were my quail loads. And I shot five Arizona truckers with that 28 gauge out of eight shells. So I had no complaints. Some people would say those were imaginary truckers because there aren't supposed to be any in Arizona. Well, um. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever, if you know anything about the history of the strip. I do. Okay, <laughs> in fact, well, I could I could show you an incredible cave with some incredible petroglyphs in it. The, have you ever heard of the uh, Pakun Springs? No. Well, Pakun Springs is an area where there's three ponds. There used to be an alligator out there. <laughs> well, um, now we're going deep. Next, you're going to tell me you you scared off a herd of unicorns while you're <laughs> fighting off the alligator. Hey, when you, when you get a chance, Google alligator at Pawkoon Springs. His name was Clem. I've actually seen Clem several times. He he resides in Phoenix right now. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, I'm glad to hear that because I won't ever go back to Phoenix. <laughs> well, anyways, the guy who owned that ranch originally, he raised and released over 5,000 chuckers here. So some of those birds... Uh, made it and reproduced there on top of the area borders Nevada. Yeah. And the Nevada Game and Fish had released thousands of chuckers in the area that's known as Gold Butte. And a lot of those chuckers have crossed over and gone on the Arizona Strip. So there's actually quite a few chuckers there, but the problem with hunting the Strip is during the, um, the, the, the time of the year when it's cooler, the chuckers are up high. So, you know, coming or beginning of quail season, they're right on the water, which is how I got lucky and, and came across them. Wow. But, you know, there, there's there's chucker there. There's a lot of chucker there. I love it. And, and uh, kids, there are no unicorns. Uh, but, <laughs> and, but I'll believe Rashawn Gordon, Gordon's Gun Dogs and Guide Service, there was an alligator, and there are shuckers once in a while thanks for sharing that i I've, that 
Man, I ought to turn that into a magazine story. I could probably make money on that one. <laughs> so so uh, let's get back and, and, and uh, talk just a little bit more about um, – uh, desert quail do you do you ever do anything up, up to patagonia or Sonoida out in there after the merns that is on my bucket list okay. i'm going yeah. on my third year here and the last two years well last year was actually a great year down here for gamble's quail. i heard the conflicting uh stories about the rest of the state but last year was one of the best quail seasons i've had in a long time it was amazing uh, I actually got tired of uh, shooting quail. <laughs> Wait a minute. <clears throat> Would you please repeat this <laughs> yes. for everybody else who can cannot believe what you just said? <laughs> I can't I can't believe I said I even told my wife, I said, Melissa, I'm just tired of killing quail. So I a lot of times I would just go and run my dog dog sure, yeah. a couple hours and then come home. I mean it was it was just insane. Uh we were jumping twenty to thirty cubbies a day. And I hadn't seen numbers like that in years. Um, this year, we had reproduction. I go out scouting as often as I can. I was out two nights ago. Uh, I saw about 50 different groups of, of babies. Some were, you know, uh, one, one, only one chick. And the largest group I saw had maybe 11 or 12. And they're averaging about seven. Okay. Is that good or bad? G give us a rel That's relative sense. That's compared to last year. That's below. Wow. Last year, the, the brood sizes were just absolutely incredible. I mean, we were seeing 15, 16 in the broods. I know that they had uh, at least two hatches last year. because mm. I was seeing little, we call them bumblebees. Yeah. Um, all the way into, into August. Second and, hatch. Yes. And yeah. then during the first couple of weeks, of the season, a lot of the quail I had shot were still uh, had immature feathers on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't see that happening this year. Uh, even though I did see some newly hatched chicks the other day. Well, you know, uh, kind of surprised me. Well, good, and I'm glad to hear that because we're at the same point here. We had rain at the wrong time and even a little hail, and that probably boogered up our local quail population. We're, we have valley quail here, of course. Uh, but out there, you know, for years I've wanted to do a TV show, and every time we book a date in a location, we get a call about this time of year, and, so, and they say, wow, we never got the rain we needed. Don't bother. I mean, what was your rain season, or what is your rain season looking like, and do you think that has anything to do with the change in uh, brood sizes? Well, see, Gamble's quail and valley quail um, and mountain quail, too, winter rains are the most important for them. Yeah, yeah. And last year, we didn't get any winter rains. Mm -hmm. We've now gotten some monsoons, which was actually nice and refreshing. But it, that's not going to help our, our local quail population. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's good for the Merns quail. So the Merns quail may actually be fairly decent this year if they had a decent carryover. We did have a great carryover of birds last year, and they did have some reproduction. So I'm, I'm predicting we're going to have an average to possibly slightly above average season for here. Maybe I'll finally get out there. I, I may be, uh, I may be close. So watch out for Sean Gordon. Um, hey, let's, uh, we could go on forever. We'll just do this again and maybe in person next time. But before we go, here's, I mean, you are, you're, you're like, you're like me. You were born a hundred years too late. You, you should have been a prospector walking around with a donkey behind you out there in the desert. How do you keep your dogs cool and hydrated? Well, we do our training early in the morning. Sometimes we go out, you know, depending on the temperature, late in the afternoon. We are fortunate that we have water everywhere. I live in the desert, but it's an oasis. Yeah. Um, so everywhere I'm hunting, we have access to water. So they And my dogs love to swim, so they're in and out of the, the canals, the, the ditch banks. Um, and I carry... Uh, five gallons of water in my truck, and I always have a gallon canteen on me. Yeah. Where are you putting that much water when you're when you're hunting? I mean, is it? How can I you... carry it in my in my game bag? Actually. Yeah, yeah. I mean, is uh, is it in the bag bag? You know, yes, like 
I have a pretty unique vest. It carries a it carries a lot of stuff. Everybody's always freaked out by all the stuff I have in my vest. <laughs> Is it a brand we should know about, or did you um, make it? <laughs> no, I don't even know what the brand of it is. I, you know, my wife had bought it for me, and like I said, it just fits all sorts of stuff in there, and it always cracks people up because it's like, oh, I need the kitchen sink, and I'll just here I got one, you know. <laughs> I love it. Well, there's no, uh, there's nothing wrong with bringing that much water. That's for darn sure. I'm glad to hear that uh, your dogs are happy and hydrated. That's yes. that's for Sean Gordon, Gordon's Gun Dogs and Guide Service. If you want to reach him, uh, can I give the number once, Rashawn? Sure. It's 702 857 1714. And if you didn't write it down, just reach out to me via Facebook. I'll be happy to help you there. Rashawn, uh, enjoyed the heck out of our first talk. It won't be our last. Good luck with the season. Hope to see you out there sometime. Uh, thanks for being a part of the Upland Nation podcast. Thank you, Scott, for having me. I really enjoy talking to you. And, uh, yeah, we definitely should talk some more. We will. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Wow. <laughs> Great guy incredible experience and uh out there on the desert with the the rest of us rats can't wait to get out and see some of that country again i got a lot more coming up including some news right now and then the public access segment that i call this land is your land first just announced vermont's woodcock hunting season has been set by their game commission. You can start shooting on September 25th and you can go all the way through November 8th. Statewide, three bird bag limit as per usual. Mark your calendars. And uh, speaking of that, if you're gonna shoot those wily migratory birds, you'll need a federal duck stamp. I know, I don't get me started, but you do. And they are now for sale as well. So if you haven't gotten yours yet, you know where to get them. <clears throat> the federal duck stamp is now on sale again. This part of the Upland Nation podcast is brought to you by Dr. Tim's Natural Performance Dog Food. Learning all sorts of things about nutrition from Tim Hunt, including the importance of a low ash content. If it's over a about 8% in your dog food, you might want to wonder a little bit about what kind of protein sources are in there. We have a video coming up very soon that will show you more about how important ash content is and how low it should be, and if it's not, why you should be concerned. Until then, go to DRTIMS and learn all about it right there. And while you're there, take a look at all the formulations that Tim Hunt has for you at Dr. Tim's Performance Dog Food. Use the discount code Upland Nation at checkout and you'll get 30% off your first order. Just listen to all the verses of This Land Is Your Land. Yeah, the Woody Guthrie song gets a little deep and a little bit dark stick with the first couple three verses and you'll be just fine but his point is the same as my point we americans own a lot of real estate and much of it is open to public hunting going from the desert southwest to the upper midwest in minnesota if you're looking for public pheasants National wildlife refuges in the far west are a good starting point. Sound familiar? One of my strengths is hunting the waterfowl refuges for upland birds, including in western Minnesota. Try the Big Stone National Wildlife Refuge. Those cattails not only hold a mallard here and there, they hold a lot of ringnecks. The Northern Tallgrass Prairie National Wildlife Refuge a work in progress has birds as well. Good luck. Be safe. Take a new hunter. This Land is Your Land is brought to you by my 
website, findbirdhuntingspots.com. Thanks for your support. You know, it's the number one website when it comes to public access hunting in the upland world, findbirdhuntingspots.com. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. New on the pages there, an interview with Steve Grossman, Grossman on dog care and training, 40 years of experience. Man, that's more than me. What a resource. Speaking of resources, thank you, Rashawn Gordon. Gordon's Gun Dogs and Guide Service, Welton, Arizona. Sure enjoyed that. Learned something as well. Thank you to everybody who left a rating or a review at Apple Podcasts. Thank you to all the sponsors who make this possible. And all of you who talk to me on Facebook and share your thoughts so that I can share them with the rest of everybody out there. I'll leave you with this from humorist and Miami Herald columnist Dave Barry. He says, you can say any foolish thing to a dog and the dog will give you a look that says, wow, you're right. I never would have thought of that. If you haven't tried that and had that experience, go try it today. Thanks again for listening. I'm Scott Linden. See you in the field.